Hello everyone and welcome to my lecture. Today we are talking about the blood supply to the brainstem and the related clinical applications. Please watch this video until the end and you will get the links for the advanced reading as well as the worksheet that may help you to practice this topic more efficiently. Ok, now look at the ventral aspect of the brainstem to learn the major vessels that are responsible for the entire blood supply to this region. Here at the bottom you can see the right and the left vertebral arteries. After they enter cranial cavity through the foramen magnum, they climb up along the ventral lateral aspect of the medulla. Between the medulla and the pons, they merge together and form the basilar artery, the unpaid vessel that runs up towards the midbrain. And here it gives off the terminal branches, the posterior cerebral arteries. They communicate with the carotid system through the posterior communicating arteries and take part in the formation of the circle willis. Ok, and now we're gonna learn more details about the blood supply to the brainstem following the two patterns of perfusion, the medial one and the lateral one. It gives a good anatomical basis for understanding of the associated clinical syndromes. So, following the medial pattern, look at the central part of the medulla. There is an unpaired branch of the vertebral arteries called anterior spinal artery. It lies in the interior median sulcus of the medulla, descends down along the spinal cord and supplies the medial part of the medulla oblongata. The basilar artery supplies the central part of the pons through the pontine arteries that include paramedian branches and the short circumferential branches. And the median part of the midbrain is supplied by the posterior cerebral arteries with its many perforating branches. The next, we are moving to the lateral perfusion. This here you can see the branch of the vertebral artery called posterior inferior cerebellar artery, pica. This artery is responsible for the blood supply to the lateral medulla as well as the lower aspects of the cerebellum. A little higher you can see the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, the branch of the basilar artery which provides the blood supply to the lateral pons and the central part of the cerebellum. Moving further up, you can find the superior cerebellar arteries, which loops around the rostral pons towards the superior aspects of the cerebellum. The lateral surface of the midbrain is mainly supplied by the branches of the posterior cerebellar arteries. The summary of the lateral and the medial blood supply patterns to the brainstem is represented on this slide. So, now let's take a look to the cross section of the medulla in terms of the lateral and the medial patterns which we discussed. This here uh, we can organize the structures in the medial structures and the lateral structures. Medially we can see the pyramids which locates the ventral in the medulla. In the pyramids we have the corticospinal tract communicating our upper lower motor neuron in the motor cortex and the lower motor neuron in the spinal cord also known as a pyramidal tract. So centrally close to the midline we can find the medial lumniscus which is the main pathway of the proprioception. More dorsally, we can see the hypoglossal nerve nucleus. These structures are central structures and supplied by the anterior spinal artery. It's also worth to say that there are more central structures here in the medulla. I just mentioned those ones which have the more prominent symptoms in case of the lesion. Now we're going to move to the lateral medullary structures. The feature is here we can see the concentrations of different cranial nerve nuclei like vestibular cochlear, glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerve. Also there is the trigeminal sensory nucleus. The most lateral site is occupied by the inferior cerebral peduncles. Here in the lateral medulla we can see the ascending, long ascending tract which is the spinothalamic tract concerned about the pain, touch, temperature, crude touch and the pressure. Also we can find here some sympathetic fibers running down from the hypothalamus to the spinal cord. All of these structures mostly supplied by the posterior inferior cerebellar artery and can be involved in the vascular lesion. Ok, so what we're gonna see if there is a anterior spinal artery lesion. In this situation, we are talking about the middle medullary syndrome, most likely developed due to the occlusion of the anterior spinal artery or paramedian branches of the vertebral artery. Logically, 
and this lesion will involve the central structures of the medulla such as the hypoglossal nerve damage of which may lead to the weakness of the muscles of the tongue the medial limniscus involvement may lead to the contralateral loss of the proprioception, vibration and two-point discrimination from the body and limbs and the corticospinal tract involvement may lead to the contralateral spastic paresis in case of the posterior inferior cerebral artery occlusion we are talking about the lateral medullary syndrome also known as the Wallenberg syndrome this condition affects numbers of the structures located in the lateral medulla their involvement of the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerve which results in the dysarthria, dysphagia and dysphonia if the vestibular nuclei are affected your patient may suffer of vertigo nausea and vomiting the trigeminal nerve involvement usually leads to the ipsilateral loss of the pain and temperature from the same side of the face as well as the weakness of the mastication muscles lesion to the inferior cerebellar peduncles results in the ipsilateral limb ataxia and also here you can find the ascending spinothalamic tract concerned about the pain and temperature sensations consequently you see the contralateral loss of these sensations from the upper lower limbs and the trunk Additionally to this, descending sympathetic fibers may be affected, resulting in the Horner syndrome. And using the same approach, we are moving to the points which receives the blood supply from the basilar artery centrally and the anterior inferior cerebellar artery laterally. If there is an occlusion of the basilar artery or its paramedian branches, we are talking about the medial pontin syndrome that involve the central structure of the pons, such as the abducens nerve, damage of which may result in the ipsilateral medial strabismus due to the paralysis of the lateral rectus muscle. It will be looking like an eye moving towards the nose. Close to the midline, the medial limniscus is situated, and the lesion of the medial limniscus will lead to the contralateral loss of the proprioception, vibration, and two-point discrimination from the limbs and the trunk and also at the same as in the case of the middle medullary syndrome we can see involvement of the corticospinal tract located in the ventral pons the lesion of this tract will lead to the contralateral spastic hemiparesis so i'm talking about the lateral pontin syndrome which occurs as a result of the anterior inferior cerebral artery occlusion it was to say that it very very common to the lateral medullary syndrome it has the almost the same symptoms as we already mentioned before just only you may differentiate this syndrome based on the involvement of the facial nerve damage of which will lead to the ipsilateral facial paralysis your patient may demonstrate the ptosis and the dropping of the mouth corner one two three four five and finally we briefly discuss the midbrain lesion syndromes. There are two most common syndromes associated with the midbrain the medial midbrain syndrome, also known as a Weber syndrome, and the dorsal midbrain syndrome, also known as a Porinat syndrome. The medial midbrain syndrome is associated with the occlusion of the paramedian branches of the posterior cerebral artery. The most of the symptoms will be similar to the middle pontin or middle medullary syndrome that will be demonstrated by the involvement of the corticospinal tract or corticobulbar tract. The distinguishing feature for this syndrome is the lesion to the motor and the parasympathetic nuclei of the oculomotor nerve. This lesion will result in the lateral strabismus as well as the ptosis and the dilated pupil. The dorsal midbrain syndrome is not a result of the vascular lesion. It is associated with the compression or the superior colliculi, usually due to the pineal tumor. This lesion involves the oculomotor nuclei and may result in the paralysis of the upward gaze as well as the different pupillary abnormalities, including the loss of the pupillary light reflex. Sometimes compression over this region may cause the interruption of the cerebral aqueduct circulation, resulting in a non-communicating hydrocephalus and finally 
I hope this summary chart will help you to differentiate all the brainstem lesions we have mentioned today easily. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you have any questions, please send me an email for scheduling counseling session. Also, don't forget to use the provided links for the worksheets and the additional readings. Have a nice day and stay safe.